Today's message is entitled Quietness Within. Quietness Within. And this is Mother's Day, so we're wishing all the mothers happy Mother's Day. And we're so grateful for all of you. We're going to be focusing on Psalm 131. Anna designed this beautiful gift for everybody. Uh, probably the camera will reverse it, but it's a, there's a scarf in there. And she did this, she did the watercolors and did a drawer, but you just put it together and designed it and did the watercolors for it. And there's a, a scripture here from the Passion Translation that I thought would be good to open up with. And, and it's, on, it's on here. And it says, you're my place of quiet retreat. Well, she didn't know I was going to be sharing on quietness. You're my place of quiet retreat. And your wraparound presence becomes my shield as I wrap myself in your word. So Psalm 119, 114. And I thought that was quite appropriate. So I'm going to pray and then I will lead you in a prayer. Uh, so let me pray first. Father, I'm praying that you would break up, open your word to us and that we would experience that stillness, that quietness, that calmness within. And that we would live from that quietness and peace that you give us. Give me the grace to share your word and what to share and the right portion in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Then hands on our hearts, please. And if you can pray this with me nice and with with conviction, with conviction. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Bring your peace within me. Amen. Well, Psalm 131 is one of the passages or one of the Psalms, one of the Psalms that I translated a while ago and I did a fresh update of it this week. It's part of the songs of ascent, the pilgrimage songs that they would, that the Israelites would sing as they would go up to Mount Zion. And this one is quite interesting being a very small Psalm. Almost as small as Psalm 117, but not as small. And I'm going to read it from my translation. I also sent you a link. If you have my, if you're on my texting link, uh, list, there's a link. You can click on it and it's a flip book and you can flip through it. And if you don't have that link, then later tonight, it's going to be up in the Inspiration Fire online shop. And it's going to be a free download for the next week. And I'm calling that series that I'm doing... Uh, the graphic psalms series because uh, the goal is these psalms uh, put to graphics and out, uh, designed in a poetic way, an artistic way um, so that you can really engage with the psalms afresh. So I'm going to read, read it to you. Uh, yeah, I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> so here it goes. Yahweh, let there be no pride in my heart. No cockiness in my eyes, no strut in my step, and no thought, I'm an expert. Instead, let me be balanced, my soul quiet, like a weaned child resting with his mother, like a weaned child, calm, content, and satisfied. May my soul be. Hope, O Israel, wait, confidently expecting Yahweh both now and forever. Amen. And that's Psalm 131 verses 1 through 3. And I will we'll go through it verse by verse. Uh, but first I'd like us to meditate on this word, quiet. We don't realize how loud the world is until we go up onto, go up a mountain and we're beside still waters, a lake with still waters, and then we say, oh, how quiet, how quiet it is here. 
and we marvel at the quietness. We enjoy the quietness, but it's only when we're removed from the noise do we realize how noisy the world really is. Uh, from where I'm from in New York, a lot of people uh, associate New York to the city, New York City, but New York State is very big. And upstate New York, there is many mountains and lakes and green pastures. And people from New York go upstate for holidays. And one of the beautiful things, I've mentioned this before, is that the, the lakes are, uh, the waters are very still. And so you see the reflection of that which is above on the waters because of how still the water is. And God wants to bring our souls into that place of stillness and quietness so that we can reflect what is above, so that we can reflect heaven, so that we can reflect Jesus on the inside of us. So a quiet environment is very beautiful, but there's also another kind of quietness, which I've touched on just now, and that is the quietness within. Or put another way, the soul's calmness. Often our souls are louder than a New York City street. Voices yelling, cars honk honking, lights flashing, hawkers seeking your attention, a pickpocket bumps into you, hoping, hoping to get some easy money. And this kind of activity can happen inside. The voices that are trying to rob from you, steal from you, horns blasting, lights flashing, so much activity going on within. All this noise within. And the voices are, some voices flatter us, other voices condemn us. There's fears, anxieties, lusts. I need this, no, I need that, I'm good enough. Uh, I'm better than her or I'm better than him or I'm not good enough and how dare you say that to me all these voices within our head can make the inside of our lives very noisy are you with me have you experienced this I think every one of us has experienced that noise within the noise is like a storm and it reminds me of a funny bit in Seinfeld where Frank Costanza comes across this help, help tape. And the guru says, you should say when you're uh, getting stressed out, serenity now. So he was supposed to say every time he feels a bit of stress rising, serenity now. But for Frank Costanza, the stress, the stress keeps on intensifying and growing and getting bigger and louder and he's no longer whispering serenity now he's yelling out serenity now <laughs> so the self-help is well intentioned but it is no match for all the stressors in this world well, in Psalm 131, it gives us a picture of serenity, especially when we see this child weaned from his mother, like a weaned child resting with his mother, like a weaned child, calm, content, and satisfied may my soul be. So there's a picture here of serenity, and especially uh, of, of deep, deep peace within. So David knew all these stress factors in his life that I've been talking about. He was aware of these voices in his head and heart. And that's what sparked him to pray Psalm 131. That is the, uh, yeah, that's the inspiration behind Psalm 
131. Spurgeon said about Psalm 131, comparing all the Psalms to gems, we should liken this one to a pearl. How beautiful it will adorn the neck of patience. It is one of the shortest Psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> it is one of the shortest Psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. And I'm still on my way there. I know God has brought peace and quietness within me, but sometimes the storm is raging. And only Jesus, here's one, here's one of the big points today, only Jesus can calm the storm. And we see he, he, there's an example of that when all the disciples are swamped by the winds and the waves and they're saying, Jesus is sleeping in the boat and they're saying to Jesus, do you even care? Do you even care about what's happening? And then of course he stands up and he says, peace be still. And the storm goes quiet. And the biggest storm that we have is not the storm outside, but the storm inside. And we need Jesus to continually speak to that storm through his word and bring peace and quietness to us. And then we learn as we grow to also in Christ and his authority speak to our own storm within. So the psalm begins with David praying that his heart is not proud. He doesn't want his heart to harbor the ship called pride. He doesn't want that ship called pride in his dock. He wants to depart from that dock. And this is a, a psalm of pilgrimage, of movement. And my translation here is Yahweh, let there be no pride in my heart. No cockiness in my eyes. No strut in my step and no thought I'm an expert. Humility is the first step to quietness within. Humility is the first step to quietness and within uh, to quietness within. Humility is the first step to quietness within. And we see David practicing humility by praying. When you are humble you realize that only God can ultimately help you. People may often come up with short-term solutions and techniques, but only Jesus can quell the storm. You may think you're strong, but the world will soon bring you to your knees, either in defeat or in prayer to God. And... I hope it's in prayer to God. But sometimes defeat and loss uh, cause us to pray. So the first verse of Psalm 131 teaches us to pray and live humbly. To pray and live humbly. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Excuse me. Have mercy on me, a sinner is still a good prayer. No matter how long you've been in God's kingdom. Now I'd like to look at this uh, parable here that Jesus shares or the story that Jesus shares in Luke 18, 13. I, I think we, we think that the sinner's prayer is something for those who are just coming into the kingdom. A lot of evangelicals think in that way. Oh, the sinner's prayer, that was from, that was when I was born again, but it's not for me anymore. Uh, God has made me into a, a saint. He's made me holy. Well, that's true. God has made us holy through his blood. But there's still the sinner inside that is trying to speak out, <laughs> trying to clamor for attention. And so the sinner's prayer here is not merely for those who are coming into the kingdom. It's for those who have been in the kingdom for a long time, it should always be a part of our pilgrimage here on this earth. So let's look at this, Luke 18, 13, and we'll start in verse 9, the whole uh, passage here. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, 
Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Listen to that. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humble. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. So that's God's way. God's way is the way of humility. Humility leads to exaltation. And humility is especially seen in prayer. And not prayer that, hey, I'm better than others. Look at how good I am. But prayer, have mercy on me, a sinner. Sometimes we think we have graduated from asking for mercy and forgiveness. And I'm not saying you have to be a great sinner to pray this uh, prayer. We are all in need of God's grace. But sometimes we think we've graduated from the need of mercy and forgiveness. We conduct a great event or preach an impactful Message or get a raise in our job, and we start singing, How great I art! <laughs> how great I art! How great I art! Instead of, How great thou art! How great thou art! Or we start becoming like Snoop Dogg. I want to thank me. I want to thank me for being so good. I want to thank me for working so hard. I want to thank me for staying up and working every day. I want to thank me. Have you ever heard that speech? Anyway, he made this speech of I want to thank me. And while not many of us are bold enough to say that, sometimes we think that. And that's pride rising up in our hearts. Our thankfulness goes to God because everything comes from his hand. So now let's go into the second verse, a portrait of a weaned child. We see this portrait of a weaned child. David captures a scene he would have observed. Maybe he encountered it while out and about, or he could have seen it in his own house. He sees a child weaned, perfectly content with his mother. The child is no longer constantly crying but has a measure of self-control and, and content, contentedness. The child has a measure of self-control and contentedness. The look of serenity on the child's face inspires him. He wants the same thing for himself. So let me reread the second verse with its ten small lines. Instead, let me be balanced, my soul quiet, like a weaned child resting with his mother, like a weaned child calm, content, and satisfied. May my soul be. So as you know, Anna and I have four kids, and two of them are here. <laughs> Gideon's now married. He's an adult. We have Tabo, who we've taken into the family. We love you so much, Tabo. I'm so proud of you and the woman that you are. And we have Allison. We're so proud of you, Allison. Now she's out of the teens. She's out of the teens. She's no longer a teen. She's 20. And she has been doing amazing as an adult in all of her work and her beautiful art artistry in floristry and jewelry making and painting and all that. And we're so proud of you, Allie. And we have... Eva was also very creative and Valerie. Now Valerie's home because she's been coughing and coughing and coughing. She's been sick. And much of a, a mother's life is quieting their kids. So in the middle of the night, it's been like this all week. Mom, mom, because Valerie has been not well 
She needs her mom and her mom com comes and, the, and Anna quiets her daughter down. And moms have that effect, that way that they're constantly quieting their children at first babies. Now I remember the, the day and the time when each of our child, each of our children were weaned. And I remember what a day of rejoicing that is. That means that they're no longer relying on their mother's milk. They start having solid food. So when you're weaned, you're no longer, if you don't know what this word means, you're no longer relying on your mother's milk. You can begin to feed yourself and you're graduated to solid food, solid food. And I remember every time how at first, you know, the whole experience of feeding your child is very bonding. But then after a year goes by, maybe two years, in ancient times they did it even longer. Um, the mom is like uh, so haggard from <laughs> constantly being needed. We had a cat one time who had all these kittens and the uh, Precious would look very uh, normally before the kittens would look very uh, beautiful, you know, groom, you know, she would groom herself. But when she had the kittens and they were always feeding on her, she looked so <laughs> disheveled. <laughs> the demand of those kittens was a lot and she did not look herself. <laughs> And so when the child is weaned, it's woohoo! It's freedom for the mother. It's, uh, it's music to a mother's ears to hear that word weaned. Crying is no longer night and day. And now the baby or the child begins to communicate with words. So. Like I was saying before, we means transitioning a baby from their mother's milk to solid food. It involves maturity. We can also define wean as gradually stopping something bad for someone. For example, when I was one, uh, when I was one, no, when I was young, <laughs> when I was young, I told you the story about how I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And they put me on a very strong steroid drug. Uh, and that helped get me better. But they had to wean me off of that drug. So from 60 mils to 55 mils to 50 mils to 40 mils, 30 mils. Wean me down until I was on 10 mils, 5 mils. And then I could get off of that because the drug was very strong. So this is what meaning, uh, weaning, sorry, this is what weaning means. You wean something down in order to take you off of it. And sometimes it's good for a period of time, but not good for long term. So this brings us to the subject of spiritual growth. Through spiritual growth and God's dealings, we are weaned and enter into a state of balance. And I'm thinking with balance, I'm thinking about a child learning to walk. They have to learn their balance. Balance is a very important theme of scripture. I know I've heard somebody say, they get, they get over spiritual and say, we don't need balance. But it's a very important theme of scripture. Uh, the Hebrew word is yashar, and it means straight or balanced. And, of course, God designed balance. You can't work. I mean, you can't wa walk. You can't walk without balance. So we are to be extreme in our devotion to God. But we also need to learn a balance in order to walk. And this is what a child is learning in that weaning phase. As you're weaned, you learn balance, quietness, the, the child becomes more quiet and satisfied. And when we are growing mature in Christ, we gain balance. There's a quietness that comes within and a satisfaction with God's presence. We never fully arrive, though, in this life. 
we're on a pilgrimage. But we should be learning and always seeking like David was this quietness within, this stillness within. We don't want to be like those that Paul spoke about. They lived on milk and never moved on to solid food. Do you remember that passage? It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You need milk, he, he lamented to the Corinthians. You need milk, not solid food. You're not mature. And then we don't want to be like those that he talked to Timothy about when he said they're ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. When you're weaned, you stop running to your pastors and leaders for every spiritual problem. They're there for you. It's really important for spiritual leaders that they're there for you, they're there to pray with you. But you're not running to them all the time. And when you're weaned, it doesn't mean you leave your church and abandon your pastor. Instead, you have a different relationship where you come alongside your family and help them raise a next generation of disciples. I've often seen when somebody is weaned, it's like, oh, well, I don't need this church anymore. And then they, they run off. Well, we want people to be sent. But I'd encourage you that when you start to mature, join alongside your spiritual leaders and help them raise up another generation of disciples. Be a part of that cycle of life. Um, and you, 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 in, in that time, you transition to being a co-laborer with Christ and with those who are mature in Christ. And you start, when you're weaned, you start appreciating people over programs. When you're young, it's all about programs. What do you have for me? What does the church offer me? Uh, but when you're weaned, it's, it's different. You value people over programs. You value the family over all the fun activities. Your heart is to build community and serve rather than cry out for more activity and be entertained. With before a child is weaned, it's all about me. <laughs> feed me. And that's okay for a time. Feed me. They need to be fed in order to grow. But then you need to move from that and then learn to feed yourself and then become mature in such a way that you're joining with God's leaders to feed the community. And you're not the focus of attention anymore. And I find a lot of people have problems in this transition. This, it just in that transition phase, they often fall away. They don't understand what's happening. They don't understand the transition. The transition is, is too much for them. It's like the prodigal son. At, at one time when you were first saved or you were young in Christ, everybody was celebrating you. The party was about you. You were getting praised every week for your salvation and what God has done in your life. You were brought up front and you were testifying. But soon the focus comes off of you. This is the weaning stage. And the focus uh, goes onto someone else. And this is like the older brother couldn't understand why the focus was on his younger brother. Why they were celebrating him. And when you become older, the older brother syndrome can hit you where you are not so happy with other people being praised. What about me? <laughs> I've been, I've been uh, doing good for so long, Dad. I haven't gone out and spent my money on prostitutes. I've been here in the house. And then all of a sudden you see that the older brother is outside the house. The father has to go out to him to try to convince him to come back in and say to him, I've always, you've always been with me and all I have is yours. The older brother has trouble with this transition of celebrating the younger brother. And many times we have, we have problems when the, sh the focus shifts off of us. And this is when you need that quietness within. 
that trust that, oh, I'm in a new stage of maturity. Now it's time to bring in the lost. Now it's time to disciple the younger generation. Now it's time to be a spiritual mother, a spiritual father, an older brother in the Lord, an older sister in the Lord. Now um, it's not all about me. It's about that young one who is just learning how to walk in Christ. You now help younger disciples learn balance so that they can walk without constantly needing entertainment or calling their leaders. Looking to God rather than people for calmness is one of the first signs you're growing up. Honoring your parents, both spiritual and natural, and not forsaking them is another sign you're maturing. The focus is not on yourself when you start growing. You start saying, how can I give back? How can I be a blessing? How can I pray for this new generation? What can I do to make a difference? So how do you get there? This is the last major thing we'll focus on. How do you get there? The answer is in the first and the last verses of Psalm 131. The first verse sets the precedent of prayer. Prayer, humble prayer, is the way to growth and inward peace. Then there's the last thing this pearl of a psalm highlights, and that is hope. H-O-P-E, hope. This is something that I began to speak on when COVID broke out. God put on a, a whole series. God put in my heart a whole series of messages on hope. That was back in 2020. And then last year, I was speaking on some on hope again. And I would I would assume that it's a theme that needs to come up over and over because here David is, is exhorting Israel to hope both now and forever. So it's not something, hope is not something you stop doing, you graduate you from. Hope is something that we need to keep with us continually on our pilgrimage. It's saying within, I know God will hear this prayer, this prayer for quietness within because it's his will. So I know it's his will. So I know he will hear this prayer. It's this confident expectation. So let me read verse 3, the last verse in Psalm 131. Hope, O Israel, wait confidently expecting Yahweh, both now and forever. And there what I'm, I'm endeavoring to do through the translation is bring out the, the fullness of the meaning of hope. Hope, O Israel, wait. Hope involves waiting, but it's an act of waiting. It's a taking hold of. But there's also a sense of passiveness and I'm waiting to get there. I'm waiting on you, Lord. And then here, confidently expecting. This is what hope is. It's a confident expectation for God to work, but here is a confident expect, expectation for Yahweh himself, confidently expecting Yahweh, both now and forever. Hear that phrase again, confidently expecting Yahweh. Yahweh himself is our peace. And since Yahweh is one with Jesus and Jesus is one with Yahweh. The Father and Son are one. Jesus is our peace. Our shalom. Our quietness. Our balance. Our satisfaction. Did you hear that? Yahweh himself is our peace. Our shalom. Our quietness. Our balance. Our satisfaction. No amount of yelling. Serenity now. We'll do it. We have got to find our peace in God himself. 
in that communion with him. And that's what that waiting is about. We have the uh, scarf here. Someone can take this. A mom can take this. I just took this up here. I'm not taking it for myself. <laughs> but uh, these scarves are good because first, it's, we're coming into cold winter time in Queensland. And that's uh, our winter is like an English summer. <laughs> so it's not really cold, but it's cold for us. So we'll need these scarves. But a scarf is something you wrap around yourself. It reminds us of the word waiting in Hebrew, would ha Hebrew, which has this word picture of entwining or wrapping ourselves in the Lord. And so the Lord wraps us with himself and we also wrap ourselves with him. Both dynamics happening at the same time. Yahweh wraps us and we wrap ourselves in him. And this is what waiting looks like. This is what hoping involves, wrapping ourselves with Yahweh. And it takes time, just like clothing takes time to put on. It takes time every day to put on Christ. Happy Mother's Day, Lillian. You're doing a fantastic job as a mom. And we're all proud of you. Your love and your faith. And you have beautiful children. Way to go, Lillian. Thank God. Thank God for you. So hope is one of the distinguishing marks of those who are mature and on their way to maturity. Hope. One of the distinguishing marks of those who are mature and on their way to maturity. We'll end with Romans chapter 5 verse 1. And yes, we're doing good. My plan was to finish at 1130. So we are doing good. That way you can go out and spend some time with your mom. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith in other words made righteous through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ do you need that peace with Jesus today it happens by putting your trust in him realizing that he died for your sins realizing who he is and all you have to do today is invite him and open up the door and say Jesus come in I trust in you I I Place my whole life into your hands. And a miracle happens. You're born again. He gives, Jesus himself gives you, Jesus himself gives you the gift of righteousness. And if you don't have that gift, you pray what we were talking about before. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. And that's the doorway. That's the doorway into the kingdom. It's simple. It's a humble doorway into the kingdom. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who he has, who has been given to us. Now, I would think that in this whole list here, in this progression, hope would come first. And in a sense, hope does come first. But here Paul puts hope at the end. In other words, hope is the byproduct of God working his character in you. When God is working his character in you and you're going through tough times and you're going through deprivation and you're going through a, a sense of lack and you need God as a like, God, help me. This is developing within you a hope that stands through the storm. Perseverance, character, character, hope. This confident expectation. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit 
who has been given to us. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to pray and yeah, may lead you in a prayer too afterwards. Father, I want to thank you that you are our peace. You're our shalom, our calmness, our quietness. I want to pray for those who may be listening that this would be the day of salvation for them. They would put their trust in you and they, they would receive that gift of righteousness and be saved and born again and rejoicing. I remember when my mom called me and she said, I responded to the gospel message. Glenn, you won't believe it. I'm born again now. It was such a surprise because at one time she said to me, I can never be born again. I can never be like you, Glenn. I can never be changed that way. She said that and then years later, she was so excited. She called me up and said, I, I've been born again. And I pray for that miracle of being born again to happen and those who are listening today. And, and also, if we've been born again, that we would not get proud and think, oh, now I'm righteous, so I don't need mercy. Father, we need your mercy every day. We need your grace as our daily bread every day. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want, if you, if, you're, if you can with me, for whoever's praying this for the first time, if we can all pray this at the same time, and it's a prayer of asking Jesus to come in. Even if you've done it before, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Dear Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come into my heart. Give me your righteousness. Bring your quietness. Your peace. Within me. I want to be born of your spirit. A new creation. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for salvation. Amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed that for the first time, if you're online and you prayed that for the first time, or even if you're here, we have a lot of great resources at brisbanefire.com. So you check out brisbanefire.com, a lot of resources to help you to grow as a newborn person in Jesus, to grow in your faith. So take advantage of that. Lastly, I want to pray a quick blessing on all the mothers. Amen? So if you're a mother, feel free to, to raise your hand. I'm going to speak a blessing over you. Father, thank you for these mothers. We bless them with great strength and peace and love. Surround them and protect them. Cause your face to shine upon them. And... Let people see that these mothers are different, that they're your mothers. May they shine the grace of Jesus Christ wherever they go. Give them favor and anoint them to birth spiritual children into your kingdom. And let them be honored, I pray, for their spiritual children as well as their natural children to honor them and bless them. Father, keep them safe healthy. We think of the ones who are in the hospital. Let them be healed and restored. Those who are at home sick, heal them, restore them quickly. We bless all our mothers in the name of Jesus. Amen.